Hey, hello everybody. Today is, are we nearly there yet? Okay, I'm just going to declare at three o'clock. Um, hello everybody, welcome to the final lightning talk session of DEBCON 15. We have eight or possibly nine if we're running early speakers today. And the first person here is DKG, talking about working at the ACLU as a public interest technologist. Take it away. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm DKG. I work for the ACLU, which is the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a U.S. nonprofit organization, and I'm a Debian developer. So um, let me, I want to tell you a little bit about what the ACLU is and why I'm there, and I want to encourage you to think about um, if you have ideas about ways to do similar sorts of things, I want more people doing this kind of work. So I'm explaining what, what I'm doing because I want more people to be doing it, and this is a crowd full of folks who I think get it, and could, could do more. So, um, what's the ACLU? Uh, oh, wow, well, yeah. My slides are in the wrong order, so sorry about that. Okay, so the ACLU, we are a uh, civil liberties organization in the United States. Um, <clears throat> we are interested in all different kinds of civil liberties concerns. So, I don't know if you can see this from the back there, but all, all different kinds of stuff, capital punishment, uh, LGBTQ issues, uh, freedom of speech, privacy, um, racial justice, all sorts of stuff, national security. Um, and there's a section within the ACLU that's focused specifically on privacy and technology. Um, so we're, we're active in looking at policy issues around uh, surveillance and around the way that technology influences the other civil liberties. So while there is a section here, the ACLU actually also gets that privacy has an implication in all these other things as well, reproductive freedom, voting rights, women's rights, um, all different kinds of stuff, the technology actually plays a role. And so as a technologist, um, I'm there at the organization and I'm often helping them with their legal struggles. Um, so legally, they're interested in some interesting stuff like suing the New York Police Department because the New York Police Department is surveilling uh, pretty much every mosque in the New York City area. There's informers and uh, signet uh, surveilling everyone who's Muslim in New York City which is a pretty egregious violation of their civil liberties and our civil liberties in general as New Yorkers. Um, we're also involved in um, helping lovely organizations like Wikipedia, or Wikimedia rather, suing the, the NSA for the surveillance. Um, we're on the side of Wikipedia in this particular conflict, just to be clear. So, so the ACLU does this legal and policy and legislative work um, and I, as a technologist, I'm working there to help them understand the tech and make sure that, that they get the tech right in their, in their work. Um, however, they also get that the, te the technology itself uh, has to do with civil liberties. And so my work is in not just on the legal pieces, but my work is also in groups like standards bodies. Um, so I work with the IETF, I communicate with folks within the W3C, um, I'm involved with uh, industry consortia, I'm involved with anarchist tech collectives, I'm involved in crazy free operating systems like this one. Um, and the ACLU sees that and understands that that is part of what we need to have civil liberties in society today. So ACLU is not alone in organizations doing this. There's a small handful of civil society organizations that are hiring technologists specifically not just to run the mail server. And in fact, I don't run any mail servers, which is kind of a first for me job-wise. Um, but the but hiring technologists to actually understand the technology and try to make sure that the civil society goals that we have play out in the technical realm and that the civil society um, changes that we try to make make sense from a technical perspective so that you know, we're not asking for magical ponies, we're just asking for the realistic ponies that we all deserve. Um, so I wanna encourage everybody here who is already, I'm sure, as a Debian developer thinking about the social implications of technology to, to consider the work that you're doing right now, you know, some work will just pay the bills and other work can pay the bills and potentially also help influence the society as well. And if you have organizations that should understand this and don't yet, um, I would love to help you talk to them and help them see how 
having a technologist who's associated with their policy goals, with their social goals, can help them achieve them um, both with technologists as allies in, in whatever the particular social struggle is that they're working on. So um, this is an ongoing thing. You know, if you think about 40 years ago, or maybe 100 years ago in the United States, there really were no public interest lawyers. There were no lawyers in the US who were, who were, you know, there wasn't a class of lawyers who were doing public advocacy work. Lawyers worked privately, they worked on stuff, and there are now organizations within the US and there are organizations around the world that have lawyers whose job specifically is to figure out how to make the world better. Technologists can be in that same boat and we're not there yet. We're seen as the folks who are just like making sure that the wheels turn. Um, and we should be in there at a policy level as well, and we should be helping make sure that our tech reflects the social goals that we have. So I want to encourage everybody to do that. Email me if you have questions about it, and I'm just dkg at debian.org or dkg at aclu.org. Um, come find me, talk to me, and um, make the world a better place. Thank you. The next speaker is Christian Hamsus, prison, talking about um, SSH agent filter for login and pseudo. Um, actually, Timo will do the first part um, because there's two protocols, uh, two things involved in here. So, um, um, so while you set up, I. I'll, I'll shortly introduce what this is about. Um, we all use um, SSH agent, probably. Uh, many of us don't like to use SSH of forward, agent forwarding because it's um, kind of unsafe. And there's a prog program that can fix this, um, written by Timo, and he'll explain what it does and how it's used. Pardon? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll hold for you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, please replace local hosts in your minds with real hosts. Uh, you can log into another host and execute a command there. That's easy. You can log into another host, log into yet another host. Execute a command there. Oh, no, you can't. You don't have your, your keys there. But you can forward your agent connection, and it works. But all your keys from your agent are available there. And the bad admin of that host can use your agent connection to uh, log in somewhere else as you. So, the, um, the solution is uh, to do agent filtered SSH. Um, you tell it which uh, identity you want to have forwarded and it does that. And the command runs. If you don't know uh, what to forward, you can just leave out the SSH agent filter options, and will, it will present you with a menu. You can click any of these you want, even multiple ones, and it works. And better yet, you can have um, confirmation for key accesses, but only for the forwarded co uh, connections. Yeah, and um, so now that we have, oh, uh, so now that we have. Uh, um, Confirmations that are not um, 
a little more configurable, um, enter another tool that um, that's useful with SSH agent, and that's now uh, sudo. So um, what's the typical conf um, configuration of sudo in, in remote setups? Either you have a password, which you then enter into your unprivileged um, and potentially compromised, you never know, um, account, or have no password at all because um, things just work. Um, but then again, um, why not um, whoop, why not use that filtered SSH agent, SSH agent um, connection? Um, there is a module <coughs> called libpam SSH agent auth, which will just use the um, SSH agent, uh, the, the key that you're forwarding for authentication. The nice thing is, um, oh. no, thank you. Um, not only does this um, uh, check back with us, it also tells us precisely what is going to be authenticated with PAM. That is, which user this is using, what command he's running, where, and sudo unbound restart, what are we about to do. So with unbound, we will pro probably allow that. Then again, if someone were to do this with dd, sudo dd, I don't need any password at all. I just need my keyring. And if I see this, although I entered something else, here it says, I'm not sure you can read it, sudo dd um, to H hda1, I'll probably not allow that. Um, and it falls back to password authentication or whichever other PAM thing there is. It has other nice uses as well. For example, um, if you don't have, if you have a setup without out passwords, um, you can use ch shell as well. And for the rest, you can ask us later. Thank you. I think that was the that was cutting it the finest yet. We had one second to go. Okay, next up is Cyril Brelebois, Kiwi, um, talking, telling us what does a DI release manager's toolbox look like? There you go. Hello. So I would like to present some bits of my pers personal or not so personal toolbox, which basically is di.debian.org, which is a machine uh, administered by DSA, where we've got a few scripts running. And also, we are storing the, here the, um, the daily builds we do for the DI uh, images. <coughs> Basically, before we were running on buildies, and that wasn't really cool because the uh, build scripts were running as root, and you needed some buildy maintainer to actually fix stuff when stuff break. Thankfully, that wasn't uh, possible uh, anymore with Jesse. So we had Aurelien and Hector help move that to portal boxes, which means that I, as a regular DD, can actually fix stuff instead of um, annoying people to actually do that. So it's more secure, it's actually running as a user, no longer as root, and we can actually fix and improve and whatever we need. So that's uh, that was really nice already. Uh, during DevConf we had, uh, or right before that, uh, some MIPSEL, which was the last buildy we were, which was uh, being used, replaced now by EDA. Basically, once you once the, the builds are okay, the, the results, are, so the uh, images are uploaded to di.debian.org, but it wasn't exactly obvious uh, whether uh, builds were successful or maybe only partially successful or maybe missing. We had some scripts, but I tried to improve them to have some nice graphs and also some summary. 
So we have our arch with some missing builds. Basically, that means that the quant tab that should have been running a few hours ago didn't run or didn't succeed in uploading uh, results, even failures. But also arch with failing builds. That means that at, at least one target didn't succeed. Looking a bit closer on some graphs, we see that Armel has been struggling a bit because basically all white areas are days where there was no, uh, no builds. Basically, there were some uh, file system issues and so on. When everything is green, that means that all targets succeeded. And when everything is red, all failed. Usually, that might be a kernel ABI bump or a broken network or whatever. And I'm not sure it's okay with the contrast, but here on ARM HF, uh, you can see that only one target was failing. Uh, I believe that was some intermittent network failure, so nothing, nothing rave. And sometimes we have both issues, like the last build uh, failing and then no build after that. So that's the kind of thing we need to notice uh, as soon as possible to look into it and then fix the eye if needed or fix the portal boxes setup. I've got some kernel summary to make sure to track what's happening uh, with uh, the kernel builds. It's not actually really easy to read, but there are some orange and red parts. Basically, orange is all packages, um, uh, all uh, ABIs that need to be decrypted at some point, and the red ones are um, missing builds because the, there was a failure to build or it's still waiting to be actually tried. So that's not totally interesting. We've got some git setters to see what needs to be uploaded based on the git commits that are uh, above the last tag. We've got some uh, dependency to checking. So basically testing is quite okay. On Sable, not so much, uh, uh, in particular because of KFBZ and Hurt. And we've got some nice graphs to actually figure out what, what's really uh, bothering us, like Cairo G object here with uh, G G GTK3, which I mentioned in my previous talk. So that's about it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next is Andre Suri talking about OpenWRT, open hardware, and other things. Uh, okay, hello. Um, this is a project we started uh, at CZNIC uh, two years ago and as, uh, as a security research project. We gave away, uh, well, we wanted to do a research on, on the home devices, and we found out there's nothing powerful enough to do real-time analysis of incoming traffic. So we built a new, new home gateway, which is completely built from the scratch, and it's open design, open hardware, everything, ev well, all the hardware design can be found on, on our website. And we distributed 2,000 pieces to volunteers in the Czech Republic, uh, well, in exchange that we can monitor their incoming traffic. We don't look inside, we don't care about inside. Um, so uh, to use the experience we got in, in this project, uh, we are right now uh, working on design for something we call tourist light, which is actually more powerful because of the uh, shift in two years in, in, uh, in CPUs and also we learned a lot. And uh, it should be able to not uh, at gigabit speeds. It's open source, it's open WRT based in open hardware, and it uh, auto updates. Uh, it also has some IoT capabilities, which is so modern. Um, we, uh, it runs something we call Tourist Your OS, uh, which is based on open WRT. It has automatic updates, as a, uh, and users can install other packages there. It can also run Debian uh, in a container. So um, I will show you rather uh, a video we have of the, which is very short. I just need to know how to type. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, um, it's uh, well. The, the current design is based on uh, based on uh, Marvel Armada ARM chip. It's a system on chip, 
and so uh, and the, the uh, motherboard looks like this. Uh, it has one gig of RAM, uh, four gig of EMC uh, memory, and eight me uh, megabytes of NOR memory. It has five plus one, one gigabit port uh, plus F SFP cache. I think it's SFP pass, but it uh, doesn't really matter. It has uh, two USB free ports, and it has dimmable RGB status lights, so, um, and, and you can configure a light it's a killer feature of the, of the box. So it also has a free mini PCI Express uh, and one with MSATA function. Uh, and uh, uh, what's more, uh, there's a uh, real-time clock chip and crypto chip for better random generator. And uh, if you want to know more, visit light.tourist.cz uh, uh, where you can find more information. And well, we already have a design and right now we are looking away how to fund the production of the of the boxes because uh, we are find funding the development of the board and development of the OS because it's part of our mission, but we really cannot donate more money to produce the hardware. We will give away to people. So, um, and if you are interested in the in the box, feel free to enter your email and we will spam you forever from from now. <laughs> Uh, not really, but but the uh, end price should be something like to well around to 200 uh, USD dollars. It's but it's quite powerful box, and and we would really like to see it uh, well uh, to happen. So if you have ideas how to how to mass produce this stuff, then and we would be certainly happy to talk uh, to you as well. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Luca Bruno, speaking about Rust in Debian. Okay, so, hello. This talk is about Rust, which is Yet another language in Debian. First, I'm Luca. I'm also an IRC. Uh, my main role in Debian is annoying people like Enrico for corner cases like this. There are true Luca Bruno in Debian, so please beware. Uh, outside of Debian, I'm a security engineer. Um, this is a good description of what I do. Uh, in general, I really, really love uh, uh, free software, Linux. Uh, I'm a backend and system programmer. And this talk is about my love story. Uh, this love story is with languages for system programming. Uh, it first started with C. I mean, C is beautiful. A language where you can mix a while loop with a switch case and get something useful, which also has a Wikipedia page. That's wonderful. Uh, but this story got a bit more mature. And at some points, I realized that maybe it was like not a really safe relationship. So I started looking for something else. And somebody suggested me C++, which is, well, great. But sometimes it is a bit too chatty. Like the grand C++ error explosion with one line, you can get like a multiplier for 600 million lines of error. It's like well, maybe too much for me. Uh, so I keep looking and looking and looking. And at the end of the tunnel, I saw a light. And this, this light was Rust, which is a new language which is being developed and sponsored by the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, this talk is about me trying to convince you on why Rust is important and nice. So why? First, because it is natively compiled. You don't need to carry around virtual machines, which, is, which are basically eating all your memory and all your resources. And it's based on LLVM, so you get all the optimization that are already in LLVM for free. Then, it is memory safe, like many other high-level languages, but it doesn't require garbage collection. Uh, actually, I found this really nice picture, which is both a good description for garbage, garbage collection and buffer overflow. It's really, really on point. <laughs> then, uh, another point. Uh, it has static and uh, strong typing, and the compiler is helping you with full type inference. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm not a great fan of duck typing. Um, then, mm, really nice. We don't have all this object-oriented madness around. I mean. 
if you love abstract singleton proxy factory bin, that's fine, but your key is not my king. <laughs> <laughs> then another really nice feature of Rust is that the runtime is optional. So if you want to write, I don't know, a kernel, okay. If you want to write some library for another language, you can do it. It's FFI for your other language. If you want to, if you want to write something that runs directly on bare metal, like on this board, you can do that. And we have much, much more actually. It's too long to, de to describe here. Uh, bonus point, we have it in Debian. We have the compiler, it's in seed. We have something which is called Cargo, which basically takes care of managing all the dependency for you, which is now sitting in you, IFTP master. And so please join us. Sometimes I have cookie for you, maybe not now, but that's our wiki page and we encourage you in joining us. Thank you. Sound. Hello, sound. Okay, so the group photo. How hard can it really be? I mean, really. Um, I've been to DEF CONS for a long time. I just remember that I actually have been to DEF CON 3. But my first foray in the group photos was in, uh, in Mexico. Yeah, that's DEF CONS 6. Uh, it was pretty good. You can even zoom in and see individual people. You can really <laughs> recognize some faces. Uh, but then that was just an accident. It was just an accident that it was a good. But uh, I know it now because with experience, you actually know things, how to do them right. So I'll tell you how to do them right. And uh, in the process, what did I do this week? So you have to choose a location that is before the whole the group photo. You need to measure the location. Just, just assume one step is one person. One step deep, one line. That's perfectly fine, and that's the maximum number of people you can, you can fit into that location. You need sufficient size. Uh, you need a, a location that uh, people can actually find, because if you just describe something, yeah, they're, they're there around the corner, nobody will be there. You need a high camera location. We'll get back to why that is quite important uh, really soon. And you need amazing light, because otherwise it will be either blurry or unfocused, which is another kind of blurry. So um, if you don't have enough of a height, you might get to uh, this kind of problem, which you zoom in and you see that some people don't have too much space for their, for their heads. Uh, as the higher the camera is, the more there is vertical space per person at the same density of people standing. So you need to have a quite a high angle. Uh, another thing that is kind of a know-how for really large group photos is designated herders of people. So you see the venue, you see how the people move, you find out how are different channels of people moving from where they are typically to the, where the location is. You make one person per channel, the person you can recognize and remember, instruct them to herd people, instruct them to be last in the herd so that everybody is in front of them, and instruct them to say to you, yeah, 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 I'm here. Everybody from my side of the channel is here. That's the job of the herder. Uh, yeah, you need to arrive at the photo, so photo place early and paradoxically often because you need to be there on the previous days at the same time to see how the sun falls. So you, you don't get some weird effects of uh, very harsh light, which we will see soon. <laughs> uh, you need to set up the camera. I'll probably skip this part because it's quite technical and it's on the slide, so people will uh, understand. But the most important thing is sharp lens is the most important thing and a flash will not help you at all. After you've gotten all the people in the, in the place, you need to shape them. You must remember that people actually don't see where you're pointing at in a large group. 
So you need to do them in a big wavy motion so that people can understand in a huge waves. And only you can po point to people when you say, you, you, in a red shirt, then they can understand. Make sure you see everybody's faces and make sure there are no ugly holes, which I usually fail. S and that's what happens when you fail. You get a very, very weird shape. Also, in addition, in this particular case, we also get some people in the sun, which will, you can see is quite, quite weird <laughs> getting because one side of the face is very light, another side is quite dark. And I had to really work hard to have this actually visible. Take the shots. Keep in mind, you try to painting the whole crowd and not moving no, not more than uh, one fra half a frame. In the total this year, I took 190 pictures from the roof, 1.4 gigabytes. Then for each burst, I found the sharpest picture, 61 photos remaining. I used uh, Hugin uh, Quick Preview to minimally overlapping set of images, 16 photos. But if you, if you feed too much information to Hugin, it just gets confused. In summary, <laughs> you gimp the rest in after the hug in complete. But basically, what the basic process is, you find the buggy faces, you fix them with hugging masks, you render, you repeat. You wait 16 minutes for it to render and try again because it shifts the line where it tries to render the images, making this kind of artifacts where it renders the line, or this thing, which is <laughs> just a wonderful face. <laughs> uh, oh, if people move, that's, that kind of thing happens as well. So you get this kind of result. Eh, you fill in the blanks, you fill in the rough spots. If you have a very rough corner in, uh, in multiple places, you put the next year's logo as well, and put yourself in as well. Don't, don't finish that, that's a very important part. So that's, that's the result that we can get into the end. And uh, time to make, three hours in preparation, six hours of post-processing. Thank you very much. Next up is Stefan Wall talking about Palma in Debian in Mannheim. There you Just a moment. Right click, yeah. And then, yeah. No, op open with w up one. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Would you like a microphone? Yes, of course. Thanks. Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Stefan Weil, and I'm going to tell you about a Debian-based free development at Mannheim University Library. Large parts of our library are located in Mannheim Palace, and where we transformed a former reading room into a modern learning center, which opened in spring last year. This learning center provides different kinds of places for working in groups, and most of them have a large monitor where the group members can share their presentations and any documents. Students bring their own devices, laptops, smartphones, or tablet computers. They should be able to use these, the team monitors by wireless LAN without any cables. Existing solutions did not match our requirements, so we wrapped existing technology in a new web application, which we called Palma. The team monitor shows some short instructions how to use Palma, which is an abbreviation of uh, present and learn in Mannheim. Other libraries which adopted uh, Palma later have chosen a different name like Sprint, which stands for study and present in teams. As soon as a user connects to the Palma URL, he or she gets a web interface which controls all aspects of Palma. 
This is what the user sees in the browser. And in the upper right corner, you will see the connected group members. Uh, then the user can uh, show web pages in the left lower corner on the team monitor. He, he can upload different kinds of files also in the left corner for display on the team mon monitor. Or uh, he can use screen mirroring of uh, the local display on the screen mo uh, monitor, on the team monitor. The team monitor can show up to four different windows at a time by changing the screen layout. You see this uh, in the left part, there are five different screen layouts. Each window supports scrolling and zooming and other operations via the web interface. The web interface is available in several languages. Most of them were contributed by students of our university. Each Palma monitor is controlled by a Debian GNU Linux system running a display server, a window manager, web server, and different kinds of viewer applications which are started on demand. The user runs a web browser and optionally a VNC server for screen mir mirroring. Today, Palma is usable in a trusted environment like university or private network. At least seven libraries currently use it for group working places. Nevertheless, we believe that Palma can be improved further and that there are more useful applications for Palma. You can find more information on our website and also on GitHub. And I'd be happy to get your feedback or new contributions for Palma. Maybe there are also Debian uh, developers who are willing to support special software for libraries. In any case, just drop me an email. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Next up is Chilok Tomash, talking about convenient network setup for laptops. Okay. This may be something that uh, everyone has or, or actually not really a new thing, but it may be. Uh, what I uh, used to do when connecting to networks, especially Wi-Fi, I used to uh, run the EF done, EF app commands uh, pretty regularly to do that. And I, I do not really like graphical uh, like instruments to do this. So what I did is, uh, <coughs> yeah, just a sec. So uh, I wanted something very uh, simple and easy from the user perspective. And uh, I had a VPS applicant set up uh, uh, previously. I used it already. Uh, but uh, my missing piece was that there was no uh, way to automatically get and update uh, the IP addresses with DHCP. Then I found uh, uh, DHCP CD5, uh, which is in De Debian. It's already packaged in Debian. So it sets up, uh, uh, if I have a connection and uh, my laptop is uh, in an area where there is Wi-Fi uh, available and I have the setup uh, in the VPS applicant, it connects automatically and where is the network link is up, so it's associated, it will automatically get an IP address for me. And if I uh, connect it uh, uh, with uh, like a UTP cable to, an, to, uh, to Ethernet, or I use my phone for tethering, uh, it will get a second IP address on that interface and it will also set up a second uh, uh, default route with a different routing metric. So the, the wired uh, uh, network will be, will be more preferable 
that's what it will use uh, to route my outside connection. But if I also like, if I, I in, the, in the wired uh, network, I also connect it to some local machine or something like that, I can also use that connection as well. So uh, in this uh, page I described, uh, uh, this is my, this is the U URL, the, this is cstamas.hu. Uh, there is a blog post there, which you can find, and the setup is described there. Uh, the only, I created a systemd unit five uh, file uh, for, <laughs> for better integration. Uh, I diverted DH client because I didn't find an efficient way to, to remove that. I use this, and uh, <coughs> this is uh, how VPS applicant configured. And all the thing I do after boot up is that I uh, bring the interfaces up with EF up, and uh, then everything happens like automatically. Uh, this is how this seems. Uh, with uh, VPA, VPA CLI, I can manually select networks if I want to. I do not usually do that, but if some network is preferable, there are multiple available, I can manually choose them. This is like a window I have it opened as the route user. And yeah, I think this is what, what, what I really wanted to say. Yeah, I, I think if someone has questions, like in a, can, can we or? Sorry? Yes. Uh, da, 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 just a sec. Can we? S I will try to set this bigger. I think. <laughs> okay. Okay, control pass, do control pass doesn't work, but okay. C S D A M A S dot H U. Thank you very much. We're going to just slip in two bonus, very quick presentations. Um, one from Yaroslav Halchenko. I have no idea what he's talking about, but go ahead. Uh, what do you want to hear about? Uh, how many people are related to academia or research? Oh, okay, so I know what I'll talk about. Just one second. Um, so I guess many of you publish papers, right? Or okay, one Russian dot com. Yo, one. And do dash, oh, here we go, you credit that PDF. So, and there is a problem in academia that much of um, papers which we publish to describe some methods, right, they are often not, um, what is it? They're not referenced in the publications because let's say uh, your library is used somewhere under uh, the hood of the application, yes, and where is your mode, where is full page? Presentation, here we go. There we go. So, no logo yet, and I want to present you a new credit project which we started just a few months ago, and there is no logo if you are keen on art. We have ideas, but we have no implementation. And the problems I am trying to solve, or we are with Mattel, is in that inadequate references of core libraries and data sets which are used in our research. And that leads to the fostering of Prima Ballerina projects. You would better start a new project instead of contributing to an existing one, which is bad, right? Um, not all together, but quite often. So what we want to achieve is that to make it really easy to collect specific references for methods and software you use specifically for your analysis. So not all together like what I have installed, right? But for this particular analysis, what have I used? And the idea is if you have something like this, this is a simple script which uses scikit-learn and scipy specific functions. So 
what you will get if you run python dash m do credit thus activating do credit and we injected few references citations for some functions you'll get this report so if you use scipy this version you've used this methodology which is referenced by those papers and a little bit more elaborate maybe example from our PyMVPA toolbox where we already provided in, uh, citations for more functions. So I have just run a unit test which tests different classifiers and some algorithms like Searchlight. So it invokes them. As a result, I'm not getting all citations for what we implemented in PyMVPA but those specific units. And then you could format it differently. You could format that as BIPTEC and plug it in into your publication. So uh, how you could use it, you could use that stop pi, so which provides API, so it's safe to put it in your code and start using those, putting those citations in your code. Or you could add um, injections. So if you have some software which you maintain and you want to have those citations provided for specific methods or you know that your method is implemented somewhere in Python, uh, add us those injections then we could automatically provide those references for your papers. And also, we would love to have uh, support for other languages. We are already discussing MATLAB and Octave. And if R is big on uh, scientific computing, so that would be useful. And C, C++, there are ways also how to deal with this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now on to our... Thank you very much. Now on to the very last presentation. It is Valesio talking about DebianArt.org. Are you ready? Um, oh dear. Hi. <laughs> okay. I don't speak English very well, but uh, I make this slide. One moment. And okay. Uh oh. oh. Yeah, it's possible. I don't believe. <laughs> okay. Um, I make... Uh, okay, my name is Valesio. I make artwork for Debian community for DebConf many years. In 2007, I make this platform, DebianArt.org. Uh, this is platform uh, have uh, 1200 users. <laughs> If you want that two gigabyte files that work for any team projects uh, related uh, of Debian community. Uh, <coughs> make your papers, websites, a splash. Okay. Uh, this is platform. Oops, sorry. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, this is platform. Uh, use the PHP old version, big version. Three years, not to update. Very bugs, many problems. In this DebConf, I work with uh, Larissa Reis, Thiago Ribeiro, and migrate this is platform to collabdebian.net. This is collabdebian.net, this is platform for non-developed Debian collaborations. Uh, uh, users and the collaboration community for Debian artwork, music, design, uh, anything. Uh, this is platform using Nosfero, uh, Urban Rails, Postgres, Exist packages for Debian, but I'm be the zero developer. <laughs> Thank you, <De> <laughs> Thank you, the zero. Um, Singing up, this is platform as uh, using Kali's design, uh, the same website. Uh, you join and exist the papers. Uh, I, I, I migration debianart.org to this platform. Exist mu one two zero zero users. Exist the communities also only. Uh, exist two two three communities. But okay, <laughs> uh, exist. Uh, it's possible uh, events in in the world of Debian and articles, uh, anything, uh, images, a doc, docs no or DF. <laughs> And example, um, Julieta, this is a user, uh, many collaboration, collaboration for Debian art. Uh, Julieta, make this a uh, jazz artwork. Uh, this is artwork now, this jazz release, make it by Juliet. This is gallery, Julieta from Debian art, migrated to 
collab with Debian. That's not. Thank you. Thank you all very much for attending. The next lightning talk session will be sometime in July 2016 in Cape Town.